this week on The Travel Detective. Are you sick and tired of sitting in that center seat? Not to worry, we've got some surprises for you. I'm gonna show you the most over-the-top airline seats in the world. That's our cover story. Welcome to the world's best in air travel. Plus, if you think Hilton Head, South Carolina is nothing but golf and timeshares, well, you might want to think again. We'll show you the hidden gems of the low country. Here's a hint. I hope you like shrimp. We are shrimp and whoa. That's how you catch some shrimp. And we take you to the Middle East for a vacation of volunteer tourism unlike any other, a special falcon sanctuary in Abu Dhabi. I'm Peter Greenberg. Those stories and more on this week's edition of The Travel Detective. Every year at major business travel conventions like the Global Business Travel Association meeting in Los Angeles, every single airline shows up to do what? To show off. No, we're not talking the coach seats, we're talking the premium seats. In this case, the Air France business class seat. Not bad, right? It's your own little cocoon. The airline industry is one of the most competitive in the world, especially when it comes to the front of the cabin. It's not about the airlines trying to pack more and more bodies on board in the back of the plane. It's all about yield how much they can get for any one seat, especially in business and first class. But first, they've got to get you in that cabin. Get a load of these premium seats. Or these. And here's the live flatbed from Alitalia. Buena note. But it's not just the international carriers that are stepping up their first class and business class game. Even JetBlue is getting into the act. On every one of their Transcon flights between Los Angeles and New York, they've got these mint seats, 16 of them. 12 regular mint seats, and then four little suites like this. It's a new approach for an airline that up to now has been known as just a discount carrier. We've evolved the airline with the, the need of the, the, the traveler. But we focused on the high-value leisure traveler first with the Mint product. And what we're starting to see is that the corporate traveler is actually becoming much more interested in it. And they'll pay for it. And they'll pay for it. And just how much will they pay? Tickets start at 600 bucks. It's still below the four-digit ticket prices business travelers usually cough up. Turns out, while most of us are still hunting down the best rates we can find, plenty of other folks are part of the upsell. They want to move to the front. How quickly it's changed since 2009, right? As we saw the market and the economy come back, nobody wanted a premium seat. But once they started traveling more internationally, the business started coming back, the economy started coming back, everybody's gonna chase after that, that uh, premium customer where the profitability lies. And the best place to find those premium customers? Look no further than the international terminal. These are the travelers spending top dollar for top of the line service. And nowhere is that more evident than the Gulf states. In the Gulf countries, it's a cutthroat game of competition between the airlines to see who can outdo the other in terms of comfort, style, and, of course, upgrades. When Emirates introduced their A380s, they put on showers for their first-class passengers. Now it's Etihad's turn. The Abu Dhabi-based carrier has gone not just one step, but a few steps further. Look at these sliding compartments. Privacy for all their first-class passengers. But then, they did something even wilder. I'll call it the ultimate upgrade. Some airplanes have a little extra legroom. Others have seats that recline into beds. And then there's this A380, which gives its passengers their very own living quarters. Welcome to the world's best in air travel. This is first class. This is our new apartments. We call board. this the apartments. We have stretched the propositions. You have your seat. You have your bed. In fact, this is a couch when it's not being used. So, in fact, it's a sitting room. This is the double cabin. So if you're actually traveling with someone, you can actually, uh, you're... I got it. Beds, lounge chairs, big screen TVs, even a vanity cabinet. This A380 aircraft has nine of these high-end apartments. And then there's the spacious lobby lounge of the Etihad A380. Pretty cool, huh? Date. Really? Don't even think about it. 
Airlines like Etihad cater to a high-end business clientele, travelers who might spend 10, even 15 hours on a direct flight from New York to Abu Dhabi. But what if having your own suite with a shared lounge still isn't enough? Well then, maybe this is more your speed. The, this is called the residence. This is the residence. And again, for people on those long sectors, this is the first cabin in the world where you and your partner or two people can actually sit together for landing and take off. And effectively, this is your sitting room where you can have your meals, you can read your papers, you can see the widescreen TV. And how many of these are there on a plane? There's one on each aircraft. So on the A380, there's one residence. But for the residence, let's have a look what we have in store. Okay, now this is the bathroom? This is a, this oh, is wait a, a minute, this is more than a bathroom. Wow. The door closes, you have your privacy, you have the shower. I'll just fly in here. No problem, <laughs> but, but Peter, there's more. There's more. We, in fact, have a bedroom. It's, it's a double bed. Um, it's been tested, not by me, but it's a, it's a double bed. It's got a huge TV, and we've, in fact, delivered the private jet concept into a long-haul aircraft, in now, the A380. we know what first class costs, we know what business class costs, we know what coach costs, but there's only one of these on the plane. There's only one of these on, on each aircraft. And, and it costs? Well, the cost from Abu Dhabi to London will be $20,000 US. $20,000 for one ticket on their shortest leg. You've got your own sitting room, shower, bedroom, but also you have a butler. So this really is the ultimate upgrade. You bet. There's nothing like it on a commercial carrier in the world. Next thing you know, you'll be doing weddings up here. Whatever our guest wants, we'll deliver. <laughs> but there may be some good news. The cost for the residence is $20,000 per ticket for one or two people. So take it from me. If you're spending $20,000 for this flight and you're flying by yourself, you're a loser. If you want to see some of the best in contemporary art these days, buy a ticket, an airline ticket. You may not have noticed, but airports have been spending heavily on public art over the last 10 years, trying to turn atriums of stress into calm rest stops. If you have to be delayed, at least there's something interesting to look at. The new terminal here at Dallas Love Field is filled with $3.2 million worth of art, mostly Texas images ranging from prairie landscapes to a giant sculpture of birds in flight Miami International Airport has a half-mile walkway embedded with cast bronze, fish, shells, and other elements. Sacramento, California has a 56-foot-long aluminum red rabbit seemingly jumping out of the ceiling and into a suitcase. Airport terminals of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s were typically designed with low ceilings, few windows, and lots of hot dog and magazine vendors. New terminals typically have large open atriums, plus high ceilings and walls of windows to ease claustrophobia. Those open spaces create unique opportunities for huge sculptures. Pay attention the next time you're racing through an airport and maybe bypass that rotisserie hot dog and admire some art. I'm Scott McCartney for The Travel Detective. There's nothing worse than waiting in an unmoving customs line after a long, tiring international flight. And some airport's lines are more clogged than others. The worst average wait times? New York's JFK, Miami International, and Dallas-Fort Worth. The average wait time at JFK was almost 40 minutes. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad, but that's the average wait time. But the peak wait time at JFK was over an hour and a half. Not a pleasant welcome home after a long flight. Some other bad airports, LAX, and Atlanta. If you travel about an hour outside of Savannah, Georgia, you'll hit Hilton Head Island. This is a beach resort community that doesn't do beach resort stereotypes. What sets this place apart is what you won't find here. No overdevelopment, no high-rises, no flashy neon signs. You'll have trouble even finding street lights. Hilton Head is a community where the environment takes center stage, where the food is local and right off the boat. And here's the cool part. They've got a music scene that rivals most major cities. These are just some of the hidden gems of Hilton Head Island. Located in the low country of South Carolina, 
Hilton Head Island is one of the treasures of America's Atlantic coast. People have been living here for hundreds of years, attracted by its fertile land, mild climate, and of course, the sea. Shrimping is a big part of life in South Carolina, and here at Hilton Head, between June and December, shrimp are in the nets, which means they're on the menu. Here's the best part. You can join in on the harvest. For about 40 bucks, you jump on this boat, the Tabby Jane, and go trawling for your own shrimp. Wish me luck. Sure, it's great to eat, but it turns out it's also a lot of fun to catch. And if you just ask and happen to have a spare $40 lying around, you get to go out on the boat and shrimp. And you might even learn something. We spend a little bit of time as we travel out to the shrimp grounds showing people what they're likely to encounter in the net. Talk about the environment here, what makes it such an environment full of food and full of life. But you know, if you ask kids where food comes from, they tell you the store. That's right. So this is an opportunity for people to actually see the process and the product. And learn a little bit more about it. But we're looking for shrimp. We're looking for shrimp, that's right. Pinilla shrimp, and when you think of a jumbo shrimp cocktail, that's the shrimp we're looking for. So we're actually looking for a jumbo shrimp cocktail. We are Can you tell when you're pulling it up that you got a big load or no? You can't really tell. You can't tell, no. Really until it gets to the surface. Now you realize if we don't need, have any shrimp, we're going to need a bigger boat. Here we go. Look at those birds. They all know. Look at this. Whoa. We got something. Bring that baby right on up here, boys. Some shrimp for you. Uh, Whoa! Okay! You got everything in here. That's how you catch some shrimp. The first thing the crew does is sift through the hall and pull out all the bycatch. Those are the animals we're gonna toss back. Okay, let's see what we got here. What is that? The local fishermen call this a ribbon fish. Look at those teeth. Now you got a horseshoe crab here? Yes, we love our horseshoe crab. Yeah, those crab. are great. Thank you for joining the party. You see a little sand shark there. Shark nose, sand sharks, all sorts of different sharks. Yeah. Hold your hands together with your pinkies touching. There you go. Oh, yeah. There's a juvenile butterfly right here. He goes back in, right? He goes right okay, in the water. Right That's in. right. We, we, need help. we need help rescuing these guys. We don't oh. want anyone to suffer from the trawl. Mostly what we're left with, we do have some small bait fish here on the table. And you give these to the birds now? Uh, yes. Most of these we can throw to the bird. Give me one of those. There you go. Okay, just throw them throw out. Throw it high. Okay, here we go. High. Throw it up. Here we go. Oh! How'd you do to oh, catch it? Oh, man. They that catch was great. But of course, the real reason we're out here is for the shrimp. Big ones and small. Okay, so these different sized shrimp, they indicate the different ages. Uh, the larger shrimp, shrimp only live maybe one year, maybe 14 months. So these guys were uh, hatched probably much earlier this year. This guy is maybe only a month or two old. Oh. Okay. What do we do with him? Uh, we're going to eat them. We're going to eat them for sure. But before we can eat them, we got to clean them, which means taking off their heads. And so the traditional shrimper technique uh, is a pinching method. And if you pinch down just right, you're going to get the vein out. That's important. Right. Okay, but you also want to get those walking legs on. And here's this beautiful D vein tail. And it's worth saying, every shrimp you've ever eaten in your life that had the head taken off, you have to remember the head was taken off by a person. There's no machine that does this. But who needs a machine when the Tammy Jane has these two guys? So watch his hands. It'll take us probably about four hours. And with a catch like this, they need all hands on deck. And Ah, but I got him. Look at that. Home run. Yes. All right. Here's the thing. I do one of these every 10 minutes. These guys do 20 of them every 30 seconds. Who's going to keep their job at the end of this trip? Did okay, huh? Mine was this big. <laughs> Good job. Peter. Not bad. Thank you. Not bad because the hard part of the trip is over. And the Tammy Jane's next stop is the dock to get all this shrimp cooked. And Andrew Carmine's just the guy to do it. Folks come in town. They don't necessarily have um, a kitchen in the place that they're staying. They'll go out on the Tammy Jane, bring in a bag of shrimp, and we'll steam them in the bar for them. Wow. Look at this. 
Whoa. Just not enough food here. Fresh out of the ocean and right onto the table. That's how you eat on Hilton Head Island. Now, if shrimping's not really your speed, Hilton Head's got plenty of other hidden gems right on land. If you're looking to experience firsthand a commitment to conservation, then you head to the Sea Pines Nature Preserve. Over 600 acres of forest, home to 200 species of birds, and Native American structures as old as the pyramids. And, uh, oh yeah, they got horses. Sea Pines is a sprawling preserve that's just a short hop away from the coast. I mean, it's one thing to go to a beach community, and then you find yourself in the middle of a preserve like this. It's unbelievable. This natural environment protected here on sea pines. I mean, you've got 600 acres. 600 acres. We've got freshwater lakes, wildflower meadow, hardwoods. And you get to ride the horses. You get to ride horses. You can hike. You can bike. You can go by boat. You can fish, bird watch. You got it all. We have it all. One of the most fascinating parts of sea pines is the shell ring. Built nearly 4,000 years ago by Native Americans, this circular mound of discarded shells once marked the border of a prehistoric Indian village. The village is long gone, but some of the neighbors are still around. Yep. Are they nice? Very nice. You lying to me? You respect them. He was lying to me. After a day at Sea Pines, you might be tempted to hit the sack early. But then again, this is South Carolina, and later means much later, as in music. When you think of jazz, Hilton Head doesn't immediately come to mind. In fact, you'd never expect to find a place like the one behind me inside a small shopping mall. But guess what? For the last 15 years, the Jazz Corner has been attracting some of the best musicians in the world. Hilton Head has always had the waterfront and the golf courses, but only fairly recently, has it added some new attractions. Hilton has become now much more of a cultural center. And the first thing that comes to your mind is that it's so remote compared to other metropolitan areas. But I think one thing we've proved, you present quality and you present it in terms of a total experience and people will, they'll come. And come they have, thanks in part to places like Bob Masteller's Jazz Corner. Perhaps the biggest surprise of Hilton Head Island is how refreshingly manageable it all is. You can walk it, bike it, hike it, fish it, swim it, and do it all at your own pace. And that's the best hidden gem of all. Who doesn't love trains? They're fast, they're fun, and they conjure up images of travel years gone by. But the question is, are you cut out for train travel? For starters, the harsh reality is that the U.S. lags far behind other countries when it comes to infrastructure and rail line coverage. As anyone who's taken a stateside train knows, there's nothing quick about most train trips. Even on a good day, getting from Los Angeles to Seattle will take almost three days. And a cabin on one of those trains costs about $600 each way. Compare that to a flight, and if you're in a hurry, it may not be the best choice. If you're traveling with kids, there are a few other things to consider, like motion sickness, especially if your seats face the rear of the train, so plan accordingly. Meals are often included for first class and sleeping cabin passengers, but if you've got picky eaters and you're on a trip from Chicago to San Francisco, options start to look pretty limited after 50 hours. My advice for first timers, start with a shorter excursion, like an 11 hour ride from New York to Montreal. There's no better time to do this than in the fall when you can catch the changing leaves of upstate New York. Or make it a package with overnight hotel stays and guided tours so you get a break from the train with the added bonus of seeing towns you may miss if you only travel by plane. Once you've figured out the basics, it's easy to get hooked on the romanticism of train travel. But know what you're in store for, and then jump on a long haul journey and see where the ride takes you. Abu Dhabi is known for its cutting edge modern architecture. But to experience a completely different side of the city's culture, a side that connects it to its roots, you got to check this place out. 
the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital. More than 7,000 birds a year come here, not just because they're sick, some of them just need a pedicure. The Falcon Hospital was established in 1999 and is the largest Falcon Hospital in the world. But why Abu Dhabi? Well, falconry has a tradition that spans hundreds of years among the Bedouins, an ancient tribal people that today populate much of the modern Arab world. And their connection with falconry continues strong today. Falconry is very, very important to Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates. In former times, falcons were used to help the Bedouins' families to hunt meat to let the Bedouin families survive in the desert. So for the Emiratis here, falconry is a very important link to their past, to go back to their own roots, to reconnect to their tradition and their values. And if you want to learn more about this tradition, the hospital offers tours year-round and internships to qualified candidates. As an intern, you'll get to watch and work along Chief Dr. Margaret Muller as she cares for these magnificent birds. Now here we do everything from routine procedures, let's say like manicures and, and pedicures for falcons, to repairing feathers when they break feathers. But we are also doing very advanced uh, diagnostic methods like endoscopies. We are doing surgeries, for example, when a falcon has a broken leg or a broken wing. Falcon owners usually bring their birds into the hospital twice a year for checkups and grooming. Here, Dr. Muller prepares a falcon for this routine procedure. The bird is first anesthetized. Then the feathers are checked in case of any breakage. And then the toenails are trimmed and filed down. And last, the beak is trimmed and then filed. All of this is done to keep the animal healthy. Uh, when we do pedicure in falcons, it's not like in ladies, when we do it for kind of pampering, actually. In falcons, it's required to keep them healthy. So it's really something which must be done and not for beauty purposes. Keeping them healthy is important because the Emiratis travel around the region on hunting trips, along with their bird. And when the falcons travel, they do it in style. The falcons are the only animals in the whole world that possess their own passport. So they are the only animals in the whole world that are allowed to board the passenger cabin of our Arab airplanes like Etihad or Emirates without a transport box, which means they fly like you and me as passengers. So if you're thinking that a falcon would make a pretty good pet, you'd better start saving. Some of the most prized birds can run you as much as $70,000. Now that may seem like a lot of money, but for the Emiratis, it's more than just money. It's about preserving a way of life that spans generations. And here at the Falcon Hospital, you can experience a piece of that ancient tradition for yourself. Can you name the airline that many Americans claim they dislike the most? If you guessed Spirit, you'd be right. So what did the airline do? They did their own hate survey. That's right, they wanted to find out what Americans hated most about airlines and why. And you'll never guess which airline came in first as the most hated airline. What a surprise, it was Spirit. But the results are also revealing in what you hated about other airlines and why. Nearly 30,000 travelers filled out Spirit's hate survey. The top complaints? cramped seats, lost bags, and flight delays. And all the major airlines felt the heat, including Southwest, United, and American. Nevertheless, even though they sponsored the survey, Spirit still received the lion's share of the blame. To say the least, the Spirit survey was entertaining and it got our attention. Now let's hope it gets the attention of the airlines. That does it for this week. I'll see you next time on another edition of The Travel Detective.